good morning. I tell you, you are in the right place this morning. On the first Sunday of this year, 51, 51 more of them to go. It felt funny. 51 more to go, and, and you you know, you're only here because God drew you here. You may have thought that you got out of bed and said, you know what, I think I'm going to go to church this morning. And the truth of that is no. You're here because the Holy Spirit laid it in your heart that you needed to be here this morning to hear God's message, to worship for God's people, and do the ministry here in Evansville that He's called you to do. Make sure that that stays that way for the next 51. Let's stand and sing this morning because that's what we're here for is to worship. Night of the world, you stand down.
Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. Praise Him, you heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and he has exalted the horn of his people. The praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, and people near to him. Praise the Lord. Marshall, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Father God, what an honor and privilege it is to be in your house on this first Sunday of a new year. We pray, Lord, that you would allow for us never to take opportunity to praise you for granted. But Lord, that we give you praise for everything that you have done for us, every blessing that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for those that are serving at home, <coughs> serving abroad, doing what is necessary to protect our freedom to do exactly what scripture says the entire creation does. Father, may you receive the honor and the glory for all that takes place in this room today. It's in Christ's name.
said and what it says in Scripture, that He is the author of our salvation. That's some imagery I want you to think about just a little bit. You might have a song that you like on the radio, and the reason why you like it is because it's so creative. And you might like that as your favorite artist. I like music, so I'm going with this for a second. It's your favorite artist or, or, or your favorite song because you think it's so clever. Because they came up with a new way to write that song that nobody else has ever come up with before. That's what Jesus did. He wrote the song of our salvation. There was no one else that could write that song. It's the song that allows us to be able to sing His praises here. And it's the song that allows us to be able to go and be in heaven with Him one day when He comes back for us. Or when our life on this, in this world ends and we get to go be with Him. And we can still sing the song of His salvation. Chris Tomlin, Bill Gaither, Casting Crowns, they write songs about the author of our salvation. The author of our salvation wrote the song that we sing. There is coming a day when the heart is
Lord, that there will, there will not be a person in the city of Evansville that does not know that you love them and that your people love them. God, that's our prayer. That's our idea. Lord, open our eyes to see you around us, to see your ministry that we can be a part of, to see where you're working. Lord, open our eyes to see you so that we can lift you up. And it's in your precious name we pray and now we sing. Open the eyes of my Lord, Lord. Open the eyes of my
care of people, so they got bills and stuff. So they don't get attacked. I like that. Someone who has really prized possessions. Okay, I think of chess because there's a king in chess. Uh, yes, I do. He's rich. Yeah, yeah. I, I think of Wakanda because you know Black Panther's a king. Uh, I have to throw the Marvel thing in there. I always do. But uh, give me some examples of some kings that you guys can think of. Okay, boy. Do you know any kings in particular? God, okay, I like that one. Jesus, he's our king. <laughs> Jesus, yeah, I love the answer. I'm absolutely loving it. It's playing very well. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? King Arthur, baby? No? Knights of the Round Table, anything? Big Mighty Sword? No? Okay. King Julian. Martin Luther King? Huh? King Julian? No. No. Wow. No. No. Don't worry about it. No. <laughs> King Kong, that works. King Kong, he's a big guy. So, with these kings, they're very busy, right? You can almost say they're very busy, just kind of like how some people today that run countries, they're very busy. So a lot of times, if somebody needs a meeting somewhere, they'll send somebody on their behalf. And that word, and this is your word for the day, the word, that word is an ambassador for somebody who's speaking on the king's behalf. So, What's really cool about this word, and I use the other word that sometimes when it comes to certain particular words, especially some in the Bible, that an ambassador is not just a representative for the king, but it's also somebody who thinks along the same lines of the king, knows exactly what the king would say in response to something that's given, has no agenda or doesn't want to get like a one-up on the king, but is rather serving the king, knowing that Whatever the king says goes, so whatever he's going to do or they're going to do as a representing the king is for the king, not themselves. It's completely, they don't want any part of it. But what's really cool, this word in Latin means servant. Well, I think that's really cool because there's a scripture that says we're ambassadors for Christ. We're speaking on Christ's behalf. We're telling people that there is sin in the world and we're letting them know that they need to come to God to be reconciled or to be cleansed of that sin. And what's so interesting about this word is like, I myself would have never thought that God would be willing to give me the ability to speak on his behalf. Like, let, let that sink in for a second. That me, person, Ty, who messes up all the time, God's still willing to say, yes, I'll let you speak on my behalf. But the reason why he says that is because whenever we have that relationship with Christ, we're not trying to do things for our own glory. We sang a couple songs about glory, we sing a couple songs about king, how uh, Jesus is the risen king. And what's so interesting is the fact that here I am standing in front of you, speaking on Jesus' behalf. I don't have my own agenda, there's nothing hidden. I'm not trying to get some social status, whatever. I'm strictly trying to tell you about Jesus and his love. Marshall does the same thing. Right? Yes. I would say Drew does the same thing. Ed Collins back there, whenever he's preaching, does the same thing. Dane, whenever he was preaching, whenever he's out witnessing, anybody that's out there witnessing about Jesus is doing the same thing. They are being that ambassador, or that representative for Jesus. Yeah. So, and it's actually in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, and it says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, for, for which you know sin, so that he, that he might become, or that we might become a righteous God. You screen out of that version, thank you very much. <laughs> So, with Jesus going to the cross, taking our sin, he gave us that ability to say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. I think that's really cool that God would allow us such an awesome responsibility to lift his son. Uh, it's just me. It's just some thoughts I've had this week. Um, if you were at Bible, you heard that kind of similar almost. 
But what's really cool about this, like, you have a king, he's very powerful, yet this ambassador person's like that whenever they're representing the king. They're just as powerful, they have just as much say in things. So for God to give us that same kind of status on his son and what we have to say about his son, that's like kind of daunting as a responsibility, church, but at the same time, it should be comforting in the fact that because Jesus did everything he did and will do, we have comfort in knowing that the message we can say about Jesus, as long as it's Christ crucified, is one that God will be glory in. Yeah? So uh, this week, you guys are in, like a, you got a full week of school, right? You don't have like two days and then the weekend. Like that never happened for me. It was always you came back on a Monday and you were there till the Friday. Uh, don't fall asleep in class. Uh, be nice to your teachers. Anything else from a teacher that you want me to tell these kids? <laughs> don't give your teacher headaches. Uh, that, that's about all I got. Uh, thank you guys for being so good. Uh, Randy, step down. Okay, Marcus, will you pray for us? Dear Father, we just, we just want to thank you. We just want to thank you, Lord, for, for even though we're not worthy, wanting to use us to help be ambassadors for you to spread your word. Lord. Just like the song says, Moses, make us and use us, Lord, so we can, we can further progress your plan, Lord. So we just thank you for all that you give us. In your name, I pray. Amen. I give my 
this morning by saying thank you. Y'all gave my family the opportunity to get away to South Carolina last week, and it was much appreciated. We, Tiffany threw me for a loop, though. I gotta tell you, since, uh, Christmas morning, I started to say Sunday morning, but it wasn't. It was Christmas morning. We get up, and I'm thinking to myself, my children are excited. They've got gifts under the tree. They're going to want to tear into the gifts, but they didn't. They were so excited about coming here and getting Christmas cups and taking them out that they never said a word about the presents until we got home. So that was pretty neat. But here was what was awkward and what sort of surprised me. When we got back after all of the chaos of opening presents and paper and this and that and the other, Tiffany looks at me and says, hey, instead of waiting until tomorrow to go to South Carolina, why don't we leave tonight? <laughs> okay. You sure? Yeah. So instead of leaving, you know, Wednesday morning at a decent hour and driving through the day on Wednesday, we decided to drive through the night Tuesday and arrive at her dad's house at 6.45 Wednesday morning. Surprised him, surprised everybody. He panicked. He thought there had been a car accident. That was why his wife got up to go open the door. Anyways, long story short. Thank you all. Thank you all. This is an interesting year. 2019 is going to bring some challenges, no doubt, but it's also going to be, bring some tremendous blessing. I have no doubt. I'm excited about where we are going as a church. I'm excited about those who are coming alongside of us, partnering with us, and as we seek to make an impact in Evansville, make sure that our heartbeat is always that it's not about the Keck Church, but it's about God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. It's all about who? Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you to Ed Collins for filling in for me last Sunday, for Tim for filling in Wednesday. If you've got a Bible with you, you're going to think it's a broken record, but Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. Luke chapter 2, but instead of reading the Christmas narrative, instead of reading the story of his birth, we're going to focus on the events that took place after his birth. And as you're finding your place there, I want to just throw you out a challenge unrelated to the sermon, but something that I feel we all should hear. Every year as a new year begins, many of us see it as an opportunity to make New Year's resolutions. Some of us will make the decision that we are going to kick a habit that we've had for many years. Some of us will say, I'm going to get into the gym for the first time in a really long time. Truth be known, the health and fitness field, at least for this month, is going to see a phenomenal uptick in the amount of money that they make, in the amount of gym memberships that are sold, all of these wonderful things. But the reality is, by March, many of us will have fallen off the wagon and have gotten back into the same routine that we did before. My challenge for this morning is that we not make resolutions, but that we make commitments. You hear the difference? Resolutions, some have said, were made to be broken. Commitments, on the other hand, are a little bit different. Some of the resolutions or the commitments that you are going to make are going to be pretty serious, like making sure that we're getting our weight down or we're working on our A1C or we're doing whatever that may be. But then some of you are going to be like the teenager that I spoke with last week that said, Marshall, my commitment, my New Year's resolution is to remember to drink my orange juice before I brush my teeth. See, so some of you will get that in a little bit. You ever brush your teeth and then drink the orange juice? It's a terrible idea. Don't ever do it. Resolutions and commitments, some are fun, some are more serious. But make no mistake that we as the church have the, the responsibility to be his hands and to be his feet. We laugh and we have fun, but the reality is, as Christ's hands and feet, we need to be seeking the Lord in every decision that we make. Resolutions are weak. Commitments are strong. Especially when we lean on him for our strength. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Some of you are wondering if I've lost my mind, and the answer is no. We started five weeks ago walking through chapter 1 and chapter 2 and really diving into the characters around the nativity. For 2019, we're going to stay in the book of Luke, start to finish. <coughs> Some of you just went, really? <laughs> yeah, we are. After much prayer and after seeking the Lord in what direction that He wanted me to go, what direction we as a church need to be moving, the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, is where we will be for all of 2019. The decision comes, and I firmly believe that God is leading me to do it, and in so doing, that we as a congregation are going to grow spiritually in ways perhaps we never have before. So what's the commitment? My commitment to you is to do my due diligence in studying and preparing and delivering to you a message that is not filled with Marshall's opinions, but instead is filled with the words from the Lord. That's my commitment to you. The commitment that I would ask you all to make is that over this, this season, this next year, there's 12 months, there's only 23 chapters in the book of Luke, 
my request of you is that you take time each month to read through the book of Luke. Some of you are thinking, 23 chapters, I can knock that out in two days. If that's you, go for it. But I'm hoping that as we are learning, as we are diving into His Word, we are spending enough time in it that we're not just reading it to get to the end, but that we're reading it to see what it is that the Lord has to share with us through His Word. So, would you commit to walk through the book of Luke with me, to read through it in its entirety at least once a month? And if you would, would you say amen? Amen. Fantastic. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 25, and I am going to ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'll get a running start beginning in verse 21. Our scripture for the morning begins in 25. But beginning in verse 21, when the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord, verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons beginning in verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to God's consolation, to Israel's consolation, forgive me, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex when the parents brought in the child of Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law. Simeon took him up in his arms praised God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace, as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple complex, serving God night and day in fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege that we have to come into your house. A privilege, Lord, one that we pray we never take for granted, but instead count as one of the many blessings that you have bestowed upon. We pray, God, that as we start a new year, as we launch into your word, as we look to see what it is you have to say to us as the Keck Church for this new year, God, that you would give us fresh eyes and fresh ears. That you would cause us, Lord, to see those around us, not through our own eyes, Father, but through a lens of seeking to grow your kingdom. Father, give us kingdom eyes and kingdom hearts, that those that we encounter, Father, might be seen as opportunities, Lord. Opportunities to share the gospel. Opportunities to share with those who may be in a dark place. Opportunities to share with those who may be hopeless about the light and the hope that is your son Jesus. Father, be with us. This morning I pray, Father, that the words that I share would not be my own, but that they would come from you. And I'll be very careful to give you any honor that might come this way. It's in Christ's name that all God's people said. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Throughout this year, each week as we dive into Luke, we're going to ask and hopefully answer the question, who is he? That is, who is Jesus? We know that his birth was a fulfillment of many prophecies. We know that Micah told us where he would be born. We know that Isaiah gave us many instructions about his life, what he would be called, what the many names of Jesus would be, many prophecies fulfilled. Hosea told us that he would be in Egypt for a time. Countless other prophecies. And we have Jesus as the fulfillment of those prophecies. But here we have Simeon. Luke chapter 2 beginning in verse 35, 25 we have this man named Simeon who's been told by God that he would not see death until he saw the Messiah. The first answer to the question who is he or who is Jesus is that Jesus is the promised fulfilled. 
As any good young boy as I was growing up, my mother made sure that I was raised on the finer things in life. And that meant any television show that had Andy Griffith as a lead character. <laughs> Matt Locke was a staple in our house. Andy Griffith serving as a lawyer, got a little nosy, oftentimes got himself into some trouble. But Matlock was one of those shows that Mom always made sure that we sat down and watched together. Good, wholesome television. <laughs> there was an episode of Matlock where the, there was a, a, the villain of that episode was a crime boss. He was one who was not to be trusted because he was indeed over a lot of organized crime. He had a seven-year-old boy, and part of this episode, he was trying to teach his son that no one was ever to be trusted. But you can trust family, Dad said. Can't trust anybody else, but trust the family. But the son climbed up on top of the ladder, and he said, boy, I want you to jump. He said, when you jump, I'll catch you. Make a promise to his boy, don't trust anyone else, but you can trust your family. And I'll never forget that seven-year-old boy jumping off the top rung of that ladder and dad stepping back and letting him hit the ground. Oh. Scarred me. Mama said it with wholesome television. I said, what do you <laughs> Promises. Many of us make promises that we have every intention of keeping, amen? amen. Some of us as husbands promise that we're going to catch up on the laundry. We have every intention of doing it, and we intend to, so don't bug us about it every two weeks. Uh, <laughs> we make promises. And I remember watching that episode, and later on in life, I now have a seven-year-old boy. I do my best to keep the promises that I make to him. But you know what's interesting? Out of every promise that God has ever made, He's kept every one. Our Heavenly Father has never made a promise that He didn't keep. Throughout the history of the Israelites, He took care of His people. There were plenty of times that they would walk away from Him, but He was always faithful. Amen. I think the same can be said about each and every one of us. Yes. We do our very best to maintain our personal walk with Him, and we do our very best to make sure that we are walking in step with His will on a regular basis. But there are times when all of us, preacher included, make the decision to err or to stray or to step away from that for a season. It, it may be out of a mistake. It might be something that we said, I really didn't mean to do that. Or, unfortunately, some of us will consciously make the decision that we're going to step out of this to walk along the path that we think is the better path. And all the while, God's saying, I'm here. Come on home. God has never made a promise that he did not keep. Look at verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. We will see numerous places during our journey in Luke. The Luke does a great job of giving you a lot of details about the people that he introduces. Such was the case with Simeon. Think that through. Just in that one verse, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, he was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. Joel Green, a commentator on Luke, highlights some details about Simeon. Luke shows him as an agent of the Holy Spirit, his physical location in the temple, which we see in just a moment, his capacity to borrow heavily from Isaiah to praise God. We know that Luke is establishing Simeon as a trustworthy individual. Righteous and devout, the personification of the faithful and expectant Israel. God has made promise after promise after promise, and we see them all fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. He even made a promise to Simeon, boy, you will not die until you lay eyes on the Messiah. Not all of us can say that we had the greatest of upbringings. Not all of us can say that our dads were trustworthy individuals. For many of us, the Andy Griffith character that our fathers might relate more to would be that crime boss in Matlock rather than Andy Taylor in Mayberry. But hear me clearly. Your Heavenly Father loves you. Our Heavenly Father loves us in ways that we cannot even fathom. 
I've said it time and time again, and I will continue saying it so long as I have a pulpit to preach from. I love my boys, and I would do anything in the world for my boys. The very thought that God would send His only Son to die on my behalf boggles my mind. <coughs> if it's John Crooks or Braxton, I'm telling you, John's gone. <coughs> I can't fathom the love that our Heavenly Father has for us that promise after promise after promise He would keep. So to answer the question in just one or two verses, who is Jesus? We see Jesus as a promise fulfilled. Keep reading with me. Look at verse 26. It had been revealed to him, that is Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex. When the parents brought in the child of Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Isn't it interesting? Before we dive into his song, do you see the divine orchestration in that moment? Mary and Joseph, we know, were off. They're coming back. They're doing what was necessary in order to fulfill what was customary under the law to offer the sacrifice. Simeon, a righteous and devout man in Jerusalem, just so happened to be in the temple complex at the exact time that Mary and Joseph walked in with Jesus. Just so happened. Happenstance, circumstance. I I'm going to go with no God ordained at the moment. Just as he ordained every circumstance surrounding the birth of Jesus, we see in just eight days later how he will continue to ordain moment after moment after moment in Jesus' life and in his ministry. Simeon reveals that God's promise to Israel has been kept. Now read with me 29. Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slaves in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. There's a direct correlation throughout Luke back to Isaiah. Many references throughout, but two specific references in Simeon's song. First, again to answer the question, who is Jesus? We've seen him as a, the promise fulfilled. Now we see him as the light for an oppressed people who have been walking, longing, searching, praying, waiting for the arrival of the Messiah. Jesus has come and is not only the light, but the salvation that they have been longing for. What Jesus will bring, however, is not just salvation from oppressors, but salvation in a very spiritual sense as well. Isaiah 49, 6. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. You see, a moment ago I told you that God loves you. Our Heavenly Father loves you. And herein lies the best example possible. Since the Garden of Eden, there has been sin in the world. Adam and Eve made a terrible decision. And that decision was to stray from that which God had told them to do, partake of the fruit, and in so doing, sin entered the world. And at the moment that sin entered the world, you and I as mankind have a sin debt that must be paid. Must be paid. The wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. <coughs> but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We celebrate His birth. But as we said all throughout December, you can't celebrate the birth. You can't celebrate Christmas without looking forward to the cross so that you can celebrate Easter. It's not just about him dying on that cross or about him being put in that tomb, but that three days later he rose from that tomb. Amen. Therein lies the hope. Therein lies the message of salvation, not just for those who were Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <laughs> Simeon says Jesus is salvation. But he also references Isaiah when he says that Jesus is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Isn't it neat that in this very temple in Jerusalem, as Jesus is just a few days old, in this very temple that 30 plus years later, Paul in one of his addresses would say in Acts 22, Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. We said it several weeks ago that the beauty of the nativity is seen in the foreshadowing of Christ's life and ministry. 
Simeon is excited as he should be. Because he is seeing the promise fulfilled and the salvation of people as he's holding this child in his arms. Years later, Paul would say it's not just about the Jews, but it's also for the Gentiles. That's where you and I get to celebrate. Had he only come for the Jews, what hope would we have? But he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Therefore, you and I, as non-Jews, get to celebrate too. That through faith in Christ Jesus, we have salvation. We have hope for all of eternity. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, you are the light of the world. Again, the Isaiah reference from Luke 9, 2 says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. One more example of Jesus not negating the Old Testament, but fulfilling the Old Testament. I'm so tired of hearing folks say it's all about the New Testament. We need not worry about the Old Testament. Pull your Bible out if you haven't yet. Would you do that for me real quick? Please. Go to Matthew. Very first chapter. Very first verse. Put a finger there and put a finger on the back of your Bible. And hold it up. New Testament? Old Testament? How can we not study the whole counsel of God's Word and say that it's only about the New Testament? Folks, we have the responsibility to study and to learn His whole Word. Not just that which is convenient or not just that which we find to be a little easier to understand. Luke chapter 2 again. He is the light. We know that light is the absence of darkness. did an illustration several months ago where I had to kill the lights and we brought them on slowly. And we had this conversation about what exactly is it that light does. Light exposes that which is in darkness. Light eliminates darkness. Any perusal of the news will yield countless examples of the darkness that is in our world today. Sex trafficking, murder, theft, political corruption, that's just Evansville. You with me this morning? There is darkness all around us. And just as Ty mentioned a moment ago, we as the ambassadors for Christ have the responsibility to take the light of salvation that is within each and every one of us that is trusted in Christ as our Lord and Savior to carry it out and to eliminate the darkness around us. Not just to eliminate it, but to eliminate it. It's a phenomenal responsibility that I pray that as we begin this new year, we begin looking at it a little bit differently. We have not only the responsibility, but we have the gift of sharing a message of salvation to a world that is lost and dying and going to hell. That's heavy, but what a privilege. What a privilege. Simeon says, Jesus will be the cause of the rise and fall of many in Israel. There are those religious elite that do not have clean hearts and motives in all that they do. And we see that Jesus is challenged every time he turns around by those who would deem Pharisees, scribes, and others. Those impure motives will come to light very quickly. I'm in verse 33. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel. To be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The thoughts, the thoughts of many hearts. Did anybody in this room stop sinning the day that they trusted in Christ as the Lord and Savior? Any of you perfect? Just checking, just making sure. Many of us sin in ways that folks around us know. But then many of us also have within our own lives that which we would deem to be the private sin, the stuff that we don't think anybody else knows about. The thoughts of hearts may be revealed, is what Simeon said, right? There are times in our own lives, we as believers, who have seen the light, who are sharing light, there are times in our own lives, especially in our private lives, when nobody else is around, that we find ourselves craving a little more darkness craving a little more darkness than we do craving light. What do I mean? If I know that the things that I'm looking at on the computer are not wholesome and not God-honored, am I wanting to make sure that the lights are on or the lights are off? Within my own lives, within my own marriage, if I know that the relationship that Tiffany and I have is one thing at home but something else outside, 
Am I wanting to make sure that you all know about what's going on at home? Or am I only going to portray that which is going on here? <coughs> With my children. If I portray to be a great dad in front of you, but once the door to 1404 Acre Drive is closed, I'm a completely different individual. Do I want y'all to know about that? But it doesn't matter whether you all know about it because the Heavenly Father that loves us knows us in such a way that He knows exactly what's going on behind the closed doors. He knows exactly what's going on within the darkness. He knows exactly what's going on within our very heart before we ever take action. So then I ask you in 2019 at the onset of a new year, would you commit not just to read God's Word, but to apply it in such a way that you really do continue to crave the light more than you do the dark? Simeon said that he would be the rise, the cause of the rise and the fall of many in Israel. We have seen the rise and fall of many devout believers. How many pastors have we seen just in the last eight or ten years who have all of a sudden their sin become very public and it has caused the demise of many pastors and as a result caused many others who are under their leadership to question who they are. You see, Simeon brings a lot of great news. He says that we've got a promise fulfilled. Jesus is light. Jesus is salvation. But we also know that Jesus is going to bring some future issues as well. And being a follower of Christ is a wonderful thing, but it also can come with some pretty heavy responsibilities. You say life is hunky-dory and all is well, but I don't have somebody on a heavenly realm that I have to be responsible to. But the reality is you still do whether you believe in Christ or not because the day's going to come that you're going to have to pay for the sin in your life. The only difference between us and those who haven't trusted in Christ is that we have one who paid the debt for us. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is that life. Jesus is that salvation. <coughs> Simeon says, there's good news about Jesus' future, but not all of it is good. What was it you said to Mary? A sword will pierce your own soul. Countless theologians go in many different directions of what exactly is meant by that, but I want to take it one direction. How many moms have we got? Where are you going Be proud. I got I'm a mom. Cool. You remember the first time you held your baby? Or your babies? The joy, the emotion, the love, everything that was welling up within you. In Luke 2, the, the, the birth narrative, we see that all those who were around Jesus were praising God, were excited. But what was it that Mary did? She was pondering these things in her heart. You as moms, you build a connection with this baby over those nine months, and then all of a sudden this baby's in your arms. And the love and the emotion that is wrapped up in that snuggle, snuggly baby is one thing. <coughs> Now, as moms, how many of you remember the first time they fell and skinned their knee? Or the first time that their heart was broken? The first time they didn't make the team? The first time they got picked last? The first time you fill in the blank from whatever that event was? How did that make you feel? Mama Bear came out, right? <laughs> it's all well and good if you want to pick on me, but don't pick on my baby. I'll hurt you. Simeon to say in the story it's going to pierce her own soul. Can you imagine? Can you imagine as Mary watching Jesus throughout his ministry being ridiculed, being laughed at, being ignored, to then later being crucified on a cross, having been beaten and then killed? Can you imagine? Good news about Jesus is that he was light and salvation. But there was also future conflict that was going to come. Just like within each and every one of us, there is a conflict within our personal lives. What does that look like? It's you wrestling with whether or not you're going to trust in Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's you wrestling with, even after making the decision to trust in Him, if you're still going to walk the line that you know that you're supposed to be walking, or if you're going to stray when it's most convenient for you. Are you going to cheat on the taxes this year and just hope that nobody catches you? Hear me. In this new year, as we begin what could be a very wonderful year. Commit not only to study His Word, but commit to apply His Word. Enter the scene, Anna. Verse 36, there was also a prophetess, Anna, 
a daughter of Fenuel of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. I laugh every time I read the, that phrase. Every time it talks about a man in Scripture, it talks about an old man. But when it comes to a lady, by golly, she was well along in years or advanced in years. I'm not going to call her old. Guys, I'm telling y'all, this is where we get it. Ladies, trust us here. Okay? Laugh, it's church. It's fine. She was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple complex, serving God night and day with fasting and prayer. And at that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about Him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. At the time that she meets Jesus, the baby boy, Anna is somewhere, historians place her between 105 to 105 years old. Advanced in years. Again, do you see the orchestration that God put in place? That she just happened to be in the temple complex at the very moment that Jesus and his parents walked in. And she immediately began to praise. And she immediately began to share with those who were around her. God ordained that she be there. And once again, excitement brims about the arrival of the Messiah. Simeon says Jesus is a promise kept. He's light, he's salvation, he's the source of coming conflict, but ultimately from both Simeon and from Anna, we see that Jesus is the only source of hope. Of hope. September of 88, 1988, Hurricane Gilbert hits the Louisiana coast at the time it was considered the storm of the century. And in that part of the country, a lot of guys make their living, a lot of families depend solely on shrimping and the shrimp boat industry. When that storm came in, it wrecked the coast. And many shrimpers lost their boats. But there was one individual who was interviewed and said, what do you make of all of this? The shrimper looked at the lady who was giving the interview or was asking him the question. He said, one thing's for sure. The bottom of the ocean's been churned up, so it ought to be good fishing when we get back out there. <laughs> Temporal hope. We can laugh. It's hope. But on the morning news, as we sit down and as we ponder what this new year looks like, as we're drinking our cup of coffee, understand that the hope that we have and the hope that we share has absolutely nothing to do with the shrimp boat industry. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. The message from Simeon and Anna. It's a message of hope. It's a message of Jesus fulfilling promises. It's a message of Jesus being the light, being salvation. It's a message of the good news of the gospel. Therein lies our invitation. Would you pray with Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, and we thank you, Lord for the way that your word speaks to us. Time and time again we hear, when I read that passage of scripture, it says something different to me this time than it did before. Father, we know full well that your word was written to a specific audience for a specific purpose, but that the application, Lord, is so far reaching. And God, the application that we see in this very piece of scripture this morning, is that even after his birth, Jesus is fulfilling promises. Prophecies that were laid in place many years ago, Lord, are coming to fruition in the birth and presentation of Christ. Father, this morning I pray that the truth of the word, that we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that the wages of that sin is death, but that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. God, I pray that if there's one here this morning who has not made Jesus Christ their Savior and their Lord, that this morning would be the morning of salvation. Lord, that as we stand and as we sing, that if your Holy Spirit, Lord, is prompting them and is working in their lives and they know that they know that they are in need of a Savior, Lord, that today would be the day that they say, no more is my life about me, but I've got to have Jesus. Father, if there's some here looking for a church home, we pray, Lord, that if you're leading them here, that this would be the place that they land, that they would say, I want to partner and be a member of the Catholic Church. Father, at the same time, if there's another body of believers that you would lead them to, that we pray that you would walk with them and lead them where they need to be. Because, Father,
Father, ultimately, again, it's not about the kingdom called the kept church, but it's about your kingdom. Father, for the rest of us who would say that we've been believers for years and members of the church long before, Lord, I just pray, God, I pray that as we begin this new year, that we would ignore the resolutions and focus on the commitments. That we would care as much about our spiritual health as we do about our physical health. Lord, may your Holy Spirit prompt us, even now, to make commitments that you would cause us to make. And then, Lord, I pray that you give us the strength and the courage and the endurance to fulfill those commitments throughout this year. Father, may your Holy Spirit flow freely in this room as he has thus far, and may we be obedient to follow whatever direction he leads. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? willing to turn loose of whatever that one thing